Hello. In this video, I'm going to be talking about some common truth functional argument forms. Um, I'm referring to a box in chapter three in your textbook that has seven common argument forms, five of which are valid and two of which are invalid. The valid forms should be familiar to you from chapter one, in particular from the section in chapter one where we covered arguments with unstated conclusions. We saw examples of all five of those valid argument forms um, in that portion of chapter one. The invalid forms may not be familiar to you yet. So in a way, uh, you can think of what we're doing here as review, um, except that we are now approaching the argument forms, particularly the valid ones, in a more formal way than we did before, and we, we are understanding them in terms of the language of truth functional logic. This is useful not only as review, but also as a bridge or a segue to the work we'll be doing shortly um, in this chapter on proofs within a system of natural deduction, in which we'll be drawing on the five commonly used uh, valid forms, some additional valid argument forms, and some um, common truth functional equivalences in order to prove validity. At that point in the picture, the common invalid forms will no longer be used, uh, but you should be familiar with them anyway. They are commonly made mistakes in ordinary everyday reasoning. I'm going to work from practice problem set 3-9 to uh, illustrate just some uh, aspects of these common argument forms to you. Starting with number one, in which a, f a fictional character says, the Garfields had proposed a picnic if this day, Sunday, proved to be pleasant. The day was lovely, and so a picnicking we went. Well, the first thing I'm noticing here is the common conclusion introducer, so, towards the end, introducing the conclusion, a picnicking we went. If we put that in more contemporary language, we'd probably say, we went on a picnic. So let me let the variable P stand for that. Going back to the first premise, that says the Garfields had proposed a picnic if this day, Sunday, pr proved to be pleasant. Now, the wording of our variables isn't going to stay the same. I mean, the, the wording of the sentences for which the variables stand is not going to stay the same throughout. What matters is the meaning. And we're going to understand the Garfields had proposed a picnic as we went on a picnic or we go on a picnic or we will go on a picnic. As you already know, the language of truth functional logic is not sensitive to differences in tense. After the word if, uh, we'll pick up another variable assignment. There it says, this day Sunday proved to be pleasant. And then later on in the second premise, it says the day was lovely. Understand Sunday was pleasant and Sunday was lovely as having the same meaning. And let P stand for either one of those. Well, the first premise then says P if Q. Remember that if introduces the antecedent of a conditional, and the antecedent is the part that goes before the arrow. So the part about Sunday being a nice day has to go before the arrow. And obviously, what's left over, the part about going on a picnic, has to be the consequent. The next premise says the day was lovely. Well, that's Q. And find the conclusion is that they went on a picnic, which is P. So we have here an instance of modus ponens. The modus ponens pattern, remember, is as follows. One premise is a conditional. The other premise is the antecedent of the conditional premise. And the conclusion is the consequent of the conditional premise. And modus ponens is a valid argument form. Therefore, any instance of it is valid. I'll mention, by the way, that modus ponens is probably the most commonly used uh, truth functional argument form in ordinary everyday reasoning. Though more often than not, when we use modus ponens in ordinary everyday reasoning, we do not spell out all the parts, that is, all the premises are both premises and the conclusion. We generally speaking either leave a premise unstated or we leave a conclusion unstated. All right, that was number one. I'm going to jump now to number four, 
This was from quite a while ago, 1994, when Kevin Lockery was the coach of the Miami Heat National Basketball Association team. And they were about ready to head into the playoffs when the sports commentator in Miami wrote the following. Kevin Lockery is gone unless the Heat moves deep into the postseason. That's not going to happen, so Lockery is gone. Lockery is gone, of course, means he's going to get fired. Again, I'm noticing so, introducing the conclusion. And let me go back then to the first premise. The first part of that could be a complete sentence by itself. In other words, the first simple statement is simply Kevin Lockery is gone, and I'll let P stand for that. The word unless, of course, we'll skip over in terms of doing our variable assignments because that's going to give us a logical symbol. And that gives us then, for the next variable assignment, the heat moves deep into the postseason. I'll let Q stand for that. That's all the variables we're going to need for this, only two, uh, because the second premise says that's not going to happen, and that's basically saying the heat is not going to move deep into the postseason, so that will just be the negation of Q, and then the conclusion is Lockery is gone, and we already have P for that. All right, going up to the first premise to do the translation. The word unless is our key word there. Unless, remember, you can understand is giving you disjunction, and we represent this disjunction with the wedge, so we'll have P wedge Q for the first premise. Second premise is that's not going to happen. In other words, the negation of Q. And the conclusion is blockery is gone, which is just P. This is the val an instance of the valid argument form disjunctive argument. In disjunctive argument, here's how to understand the pattern. Always, one premise is a disjunction, the other premise is the negation of one of the disjuncts, and the conclusion is the other disjunct. Disjunctive argument also could look like P wedge Q, negation sign P for the premises, and Q for the conclusion counts as exactly the same pattern. All right, I want to move on from number four to number nine. This comes from a book in Philosophical Ethical Theory written by Gilbert Harmon, who was a professor at Princeton from 1963 until he retired in 2017. He was a um, very highly regarded and uh, influential philosopher. He's writing here about pacifism. Pacifism is the idea uh, that we ought to avoid the use of violence. And he mentions total pacifism, or he's writing about total pacifism, which would be the view that violence ought always to be avoided. He says, total pacifism might be a good principle if everyone were to follow it, but not everyone does, so it isn't. Again, so is introducing his conclusion at the end, it isn't. To get variables, let's go back to the first premise, start with total pacifism might be a good principle. Truth functional logic is not sensitive to mood, so I've let P stand for total pacifism is a good principle. If you use might rather than it might be rather than is, that'd be totally fine. After if, uh, we will get another variable assignment. After if, it says everyone were to follow it. So for the first premise, we've got P if Q. Again, if introduces the antecedent, and the antecedent has to go before the arrow, so the first premise is Q arrow P. The next premise says, not everyone does. Well, that's the negation of Q. And the conclusion is, so it isn't. In other words, total passivism is not a good principle, which is the negation of P. Now, Professor Harmon's reasoning here is in valid. This is an instance of a common argument or a common reasoning mistake, a common form of fallacy known as denying the antecedent. 
One of the premises is a, is a conditional. The other premise is the denial or the negation of the conditional's antecedent. And the conclusion is the denial or negation of the consequent of the conditional premise. Now, Professor Harmon's obviously made a mistake in reasoning here. I don't think his mistake is that he thinks that denying the antecedent is a valid argument form. I think that's unlikely, though, of course, I'm not a mind reader, and I don't know what he was thinking. More likely, however, his mistake is a mistake that we, English speakers and English writers, make very frequently. That is, we often use the word if when what we really mean is, on, is the phrase only if. Remember, if introduces an antecedent, whereas only if introduces a consequent. If Professor Harmon had used the phrase only if instead of the word if, his first premise, instead of being Q arrow P, would be P arrow Q. And now, this would be a valid argument, because this is an instance of the form modus tollens. In modus tollens, one premise is a conditional. The other premise is the negation of the consequent of the conditional. And the conclusion is the negation of the antecedent of the conditional. By the way, I'm not going to go through number 10 because it's kind of long. But in number 10, you'll see uh, an instance of the valid form modus tollens from a story um, written by a Hollywood gossip columnist named, J names, named James Bacon. I think it's kind of an amusing story. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, that's it for this video, and I will see you again in another video soon. Take care. Bye-bye.